you, Phil. Welcome back to the show. I'm here with Christian Taylor. Ah, uh, no, she's being she's being represented by our, our crystal skull today. Christian. <laughs> uh, Christian's not here. Where is Christian? You ask. She had a uh, other commitment. She had to go record something. Was she on camera or behind uh, the camera? Wonder Woman uh, thing. A Wonder Woman again. Yeah. I don't know. So it was me and Sky. It's me and Sky. And Sky brought his crystal skull. Um, which is an alien race. Somebody, did you decide that reminded you of you, or did someone else decide it reminded you? I think my wife you? saw it and said it looked, it looked like a, a glass version of my head. Or, and you, well, like Pier 1? Was it at Pier 1? Yeah. Really? It, yeah, actually was. They, so the Pier 1 by us was moving, and they had to get rid of everything, and this was like a couple bucks, and I thought, I, you know, I actually use it in my office for, for my hat. Oh, see, wow, I yeah, I can see how well that works. Yeah, it's a little hat Now thing. put your hat back on your head. Because you just if you're watching on this on the TV, if you're watching on the TV, you'll notice how much Sky looks like a newsie, and that he should just break into song at this point while he's pedaling. What's, what's the big newsie song? I have no idea. I've actually never seen newsies. You've never seen newsies? No, I've never seen newsies. It, it came out. I wasn't watching that kind of movie when it came out. I my my it. kids like it. I missed it. Oh, it's uh, I'm the King of New York, right? And they've, they've turned yeah. it into a musical now. It's on Broadway, yeah, right? It is. Isn't it? Yeah. All right. Uh, we had requests for the theme song. I didn't like any of them. I'm sorry. I'm not going to do them. I don't get them. I don't like them. I'm not going to do them. So how there. do you really feel? Yeah, that's how I feel. Uh, this is tough. Christian's not here, so that we don't have to be nice. We can be tough. Wow. This is a guy's podcast. This is men acting manly. So I'm going to be... Um, yeah, didn't you, was, was it, you, you just said what about uh, uh, Sylvester Stallone, Rocky Balboa? Yeah. <laughs> That's manly. Yeah, can't get more manly than yeah. Rocky. Uh, yo, Adrian. Yo, it's a podcast. What do you know? Yo, it's a podcast. So there's no video, except there is. But what do I know? I'm Rocky Balboa. I'm not that bright. Yo, it's a podcast. So lend an ear. The uh, I don't even want to name it after someone else because that's stupid. The Rocky Bal Rocky Balboa podcast starts right here. We'll talk to Sky, not Christian too, because she's not here, and we don't even know where she is and it doesn't really matter because we'd rather be punching meat yo it's a podcast what do you know the Phil Vischer podcast starts right now the Phil okay. Vischer podcast starts right what I, you got a problem I, with that I do have a problem you got a problem with that do you want a piece of me you want a piece of me you want a piece First of, of all, me two things you were borderline Stallone and Schwarzenegger there for a while and number two, That's manly. I, I think you spoke more words in that theme song than <laughs> Sylvester Stallone actually spoke in Rocky. In the entire movie? Yeah. You may have a point. Y you were more articulate than you may, he was. Yeah, you may have a point. So everyone who requested something this week that I refused to do, I apologize. You can complain to Christian when she's back. Uh, so, did you watch the Grammys? I did not. I was, I was just back from a I didn't watch the a, Grammys a, either. I don't watch trip. the Grammys. I watch the Oscars, and that's about it. That's really my only award yeah. show because music is. Don't do Golden Globes, Emmys. No. No, the only, the only reason you would watch the Grammys is just to see the live music performances, and they tend not to be any of the bands that I would actually want to hear a live music performance from. Okay. So I don't see the, the point. But this year seemed to take on a slightly larger socio political scale. Wouldn't right. you say? Well, I, I did see the reports afterwards. Yeah, that um, uh, 33 couples were married during the Grammys. Uh, and who officiated the wedding? Queen Latifah, who, who got, she actually got a license to marry that was temporary just for the Grammys. And you can it do expired that? like two days later. I, don't I assume know. this was I in, in, California. in California. Yeah, and you can do anything in California. But anything. I guess so. There are no rules. Well, California, she's a queen, no right? Rules. Isn't that she's sort a queen. Of I don't think that does it, though. I don't think that does it. And, and Madonna sang for the wedding. And but it was not... But it was based on the Macklemore song. Do you know the Macklemore song? No. You don't know the Macklemore song? Um, uh, what's it? Uh, same love, same kind of love. Uh, I'm not very smart in these things. Okay. My, my daughter actually really likes the song. It's a, Basically, it's a, a kind of a rap song pop song about gay marriage. Okay. Because the rap community has been so anti, you know, gay historically, not embracing of homosexuality. Mm -hmm. So now some 
more prominent artists are coming out and trying to be pro-gay, pro-gay marriage in in the rap culture. And so this song was kind of a watershed song of, you know, she keeps me warm. Have you heard that song? I have not. She keeps me warm. It's a woman singing about a woman keeping her warm, which makes me think, you know, a blanket would also accomplish that. A tauntaun will keep you warm. <laughs> on a cold day on Hoth. Yeah. When Hoth freezes over, Sky. Um, now, not all the couples who got married, all the 33 couples were gay couples. The, no, Queen Latifah said they reflected love in every key and color. And they were actually cast by a casting agency. Um, so an agency went out looking for couples who were interested in getting married and then cast them by, you know, their, okay, you're but the they right knew ethnicity. Each other. Yeah, they, they all wanted to okay. get married. They didn't force anybody to all get right, married. And it was sure. legitimate. And they really got married. And Queen Latifah, re- and they signed licenses backstage afterwards. So they were really married. Queen Latifah's license expired the next morning or something, so she can't do that anymore. It was a big... Stunt. Yeah. So, so what's interesting there is it obviously got some reaction. What's so interesting is that this is an issue that half of Americans disagree with, and that the Grammys basically said we don't care. Well, it's because they're looking we at the momentum. Care. They're looking at we the don't care. We don't care if you watch our show. We think you're stupid. Are the Grammys run by a Russian oligarch or yeah, something? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Putin. That's why they're so pro-gay. We don't care. <laughs> right, okay. Because the anti-Russian oligarch. Uh-huh. So, but here's my thing. What's your I, thing, I'm Sky? trying, what's the precedent for this? Meaning, w- were there other, I mean, everyone's trying to frame gay rights and, and marriage equality as a civil rights issue. Yeah. So is there a precedent in the past track record of the various civil rights movements for this kind of display display and Hollywood focused there well initiative. You, no you had acceptance speeches people always made you know people spoke out against apartheid sure people spoke out on all sorts of things in the acceptance speeches but for the show itself to say we're taking a stand on this um, I, I want to relate this to something else, a, a uh, Super Bowl commercial that will be on the Super Bowl that's already up online that is a follow-up to a commercial last year. Are you allowed to say Super Bowl? Super Bowl. You know what Stephen Colbert is doing. What's he doing? He's calling it the Superb Owl by moving oh, really? the B from really? bowl. Really? Because he's to, not supposed to say Yeah, you're not supposed to say He's calling it the superb owl. Well, how do you talk about it if you don't... The big game. It's, it's the, the big, big game. game. Okay, there's a commercial, a TV commercial. Can I say TV? Mm-hmm. Okay, there's the magic box has an ad for the big game. Um, they did it last year, and it's Cheerios. Okay, Cheerios did a, com- a Super Bowl commercial last year that was a family eating Cheerios. Very controversial. Now, you wouldn't think that would be controversial, would you? Well, in this gluten-free environment, it's probably (laughs) well-received. The reason it was controversial, and in a fairly narrow group of people, is because it was an interracial family. Are you kidding me? No. the, The mom was black and the dad was white, or the other way around. I don't even know which way it was. It was an interracial family. Wait a minute. Back up. Enjoying Cheerios together. Who who was upset by this? Uh, they, it was posted on YouTube, like all, all big yeah. game commercials, and people started posting things like, that's an abomination. That you, oh, come you, on. No, seriously. This was a year ago. So I thought those people didn't even have internet access. <laughs> they're just getting it, and, and they have a lot of commenting to catch okay. up on. They're way behind everyone else's commenting. So uh, General Mills actually had to turn off comments on, on the YouTube page because it was getting so embarrassing what people were posting. So a year later, what do they do this year? Is it a gay couple? No, it's a new ad with the exact same family. It's a sequel. It's the exact same mom, the exact same dad, the exact same kid talking about now they're going to have she uh, the kids going to have a little baby brother and how excited they are and they have a dog and they eat Cheerios. Yeah. So it's basically We haven't rung the bell for Cheerios. Cheerios, Cheerios, Cheerios. So it's basically General Mills saying we're going to stick to our guns here. You know, we're not and we're basically saying and this is where I think it's kind of interesting that they identified a group of people that did not approve of that. Mm-hmm. And they said we don't want your business. Well, I think th- if we if it- don't care if you don't buy our product. 
because I have to play this role on our podcast. Yeah, right. I, I want to believe that they actually had a bigger business motivation than just saying, I don't care. Yeah. My hunch is they got so much publicity out of that ad last year because of the minority of people who made us think about it that they realize if we bring this whole thing back this year, we're going to get more free publicity and it'll be, uh, you, you know, think so, I, so were, I think you think it was, it was well, cynical it, yeah. consumerism. No, 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 it? no. I think what They're it was is not because that's what they believe here, is right. No, I'm saying if they put a biracial <gasps> couple up in a, a Cheerios ad and it would absolutely, it would actually negatively impact their bottom line. Yeah. I doubt they would have done it again. But they realized this actually, the controversy right. is helpful right. to our bottom right. line. It doesn't what they hurt have us. to gain is much more than exactly. what they have to lose. Exactly. I don't think they're saying, we're going to put a biracial couple up there anyway, and we're going to take the hit for it, and we're going to sacrifice because we believe so strongly in this message. I think what they did is realize, let people get upset about it, because at the end, we make more money anyway. Well, that could be. I don't know. Do you all th- agree with Sky's cynical view not of cynical. big business in America? Or do you think, like I do, that big business is always looking out for my best interests? <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so now, so you've got that. That's an interesting example where you'd say, okay, nothing controversial about that. No, no one should really be opposed to interracial marriage. Not in 2014. Right. Not, so not, but, but still, you have a company saying, we're actually going to make a stand on this and, and tell a group of people. We think it behooves us to tell this group of people we don't care what they think and we're happy if they don't yeah, buy but it's our a, Like I said, it's a very low it's risk. It's a calculation. It's a very low risk. Now go to the Grammys. Yeah. Okay, so the Grammys, this is a whole different thing. Yeah, you can look at the Cheerios thing and say, okay, mm-hmm. well, that's interesting. They took that stand that's kind of noble and maybe self-serving. We're not sure. The jury's out. Kind of moderately noble. Um, at least at least wanting to give the impression of nobility, perhaps, mm-hmm. and say we'll sacrifice the sales of you know a case or two of Cheerios for the greater good of everyone getting along, mm-hmm. maybe. Now you go to the Grammys, and you've got literally the country is split, practically 50-50 on the issue of gay marriage. Yeah, but I don't think that's exactly accurate. And the Grammys, which part? 50-50. It's like 54, Yeah, but, 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 but you got to look at the slice up, we, slice up the demographic. You got to look at the demographic more carefully because among Americans who are under the age of 30 yeah, or it's, 35. It's much higher. It's, it's a much higher yeah. acceptance of, of okay. gay marriage and things. So if you're managing or producing the Grammys and you realize we're not really interested in that over 60 crowd anyway. We're going for the. Wait, f- it's not just over sixty. Well, but the now further the, the younger you get, the more and more and more yeah, accepting yeah, it is. So yeah, if you're primarily like, going like at the- newborns have no problem whatsoever with gay marriage, they're actually trying to enter into them. In the first I don't even know what to do with that, Phil. <laughs> you said the younger they are, the more they're in favor of, of gay well, marriage. If That's they're aware of said. the issue, okay, yeah. <laughs> so past a certain point. Well, clearly. Okay. Like I'm, I'm clarifying. I want to be careful with language because once we record this, it's there forever. Apparently. <laughs> but I hope our listeners have the intelligence to figure out what I'm saying. Is that The Grammys are, are probably <laughs> well, more interested in attracting a crowd that's under the age of 40. Yeah. And they know that among that group, there's a very high level of acceptance for gay marriage. So you think it was still uh, it was not financial that, calculus? Yeah. It was. Well, I don't think they had to do it, but I think right. they knew that they were not going to be hurt by doing this. Right. Okay. But now Natalie Grant, Christian singer Natalie Grant, who was up for a Grammy, she and her husband actually left the show early. And they, wouldn't, they didn't say it was about that because they said the whole show was hypersexualized. So, but do we know when they left the show? No, they're not saying when they left the show. There's got to be footage. Everybody wants to know when they left the show, and we don't know when they left the show. And, and, and she got some heat online because people assumed, ah, you're a Christian. You just don't think gay people should be able to be together, and that's why you left the show because you hate gay people. Did she win a Grammy? No, she was nominated. And did maybe, she maybe leave? She left because she lost. But maybe did, she, did she leave after her category was called? Yeah, because the little categories aren't even in the show. But the, she was still invited. The pre-show. Yeah, you get oh. to stay. It's the same thing with the Dove Awards. If unless you're a big award, you don't even get to be in the show part of the show. Have you been? You've been there. Yeah, yeah. Pre-show. I, I was a presenter at the Dove Awards. You were pre-show. And which voice did you use? Pre-show. The voice I like to call Phil. Oh. And I was there with Lisa, with my wife. We both were presenters. Is that televised? 
Uh, uh, it depends on how you define televised. <laughs> it has been variously televised on a number of different networks over the years. Okay. It may be on GMC now, which they changed the name to Up or Aspire or Up, Inspire Up or something like that. I don't. I don't. People, people can correct me. Um, my friend uh, David Fitch. Do you know who David I, Fitch he's is? He's my friend, too. No, he's not. Yes, he's he is. He's only my friend. He's my friend. He told me he doesn't really like you. Um, he's a uh, theologian a professor at uh, Northern Baptist Seminary. He wrote a blog post about the Grammys and, sa- and said, he said, uh, I argued on Facebook today that one can only make sense of the marriage of 33 couples and the celebration of love by Queen Latifah and Macklemore at the Grammys by placing it within the entire three and a half hour liturgy that was the Grammys 2014 production. It's from within this whole liturgy that we find what love and marriage might mean for the Grammys. And he's talking about from the get-go, you know, the, the opening number was Beyonce and Jay, Jay, Jay-Z. Jay-Z, who are married, but doing a really sexual performance of a song well, that you know, offended a lot of people. At least they're keeping it in the family. And then going right through there. So, so uh, from the, the response to his Facebook post, he says, I took away three things. Love for the Grammys is an ecstatic self-expression. It's about me. not love for the Grammys. It's no. love. <laughs> love, love, love in the context right. of the Grammys. <laughs> is Prepositions about ex- matter. Ecstatic self-expression. Uh, second point he took away from the feedback was love for the Grammys may be unclear and confused. But another of the Facebook commentators pointed out that the church's example of love is also unclear and confused. I agree. So that the casual observer could not make a distinction between love in the church and love at the Grammys. In some cases, I think that's probably true. Love in the church isn't as sexy. Does, there's not as much fishnet. Depends on the church. I heard about this one Catholic church in Chicago. Yeah? They do a... Sexy Grammys? They do like a Friday or a Saturday night mass. And, yeah. and apparently all the young single folks go hang out there and they... Oh, it's like hookup culture. Well, like, they, they, like yeah, they meet hookup. Yeah, there's there's a term for that mass. That Uh-oh. Do I want to know? The, it rhymes with mass, mass. Oh, you're kidding yeah. me. Uh-huh. Oh. And then, then they go they go to the clubs afterwards. So it's kind of a. That seems wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, Finally, love for the Grammys is a master signifier used by the industry to make money. In reality, it really doesn't mean anything. Love, quote unquote, sells. It makes us feel good. And as a symbol of the Grammys, it hides the many abusive duplicities within the commercial music industry, sexualizing of love and women, all by making us feel better about ourselves. I think what he's getting at is that we use the word love or, or pop culture uses the word love as a sort of Rorschach test. Yeah. You know, they just throw it up there. And then and, whatever and, you see. And whatever you want to project into that word, you can do that. Yeah. And it's, it's a nice, happy word that makes everyone yeah. feel good because you project whatever you want onto it. And it means... What does it mean in, the, in, in pop culture? I think it's usually Nothing? a feeling. Yeah. It's a euphoric feeling yeah. of infatuation. Um, but it's not certainly a biblical definition of have, love. Have, do you think the church has, in general, has failed, has let go of the term, you know, in, in terms of really defining it, saying uh, this is how we're distinct? Not everywhere, but certainly in some places. I would like a blanket statement about the entire <laughs> church. I think the church in America in general struggles to challenge people's culturally defined desires. Yeah. So we tend to say your desires are just fine. You're going about achieving them the wrong way. Come into the church and we'll help you get them Jesus way, which is a problem. What we need to do is, is not just that, but help people really examine their desires, where they come from, why they have them, and then reevaluate them. Are right. these the right desires for me to live in my, to live my life pursuing? Right. So, and certainly the word love is completely unbiblically defined by our culture and the church ought to be a community in which we help correct that definition something else interesting was happening at the same time the grammys were on i don't know if you know about this what is it uh the disney channel introduced its first same-sex couple okay wait a minute i want everybody to know in advance that i don't have any forewarning of what you were going to bring up on this (laughs) podcast because otherwise i would definitely say phil i don't think that's a good idea (laughs) and i have to gather my thoughts on the fly 
whereas you've probably been thinking about this for a week. I have 12 points I'd like to make about this story. How many do you have? I'll alternate my points with your points. Is this an animated Disney? Co- no, thing? no, a Good Luck Charlie. You know the show Good yes, Luck Charlie? Yes, I do know Good Luck Charlie. Okay. On Good Luck Charlie, the same day that same-sex couples swapped vows on the Grammy stage. Is this like a coordinated thing? A quieter moment of LGBT history was being made further down the TV dial. The Disney Channel introduced its first same-sex couple, Lesbian Moms, on Good Luck Charlie. In Sunday's episode, Charlie's parents set up a family play date with their preschooler's new friend, Taylor, only dad. Bob thinks Taylor's mom's name is Cheryl, while mom, Amy, swears it's Susan. Is Taylor's mom Cheryl or Susan? Cue the doorbell and then a pair of smiling blondes in the doorway. Bob smacks his forehead. Taylor has two moms. So that's like a, it's a main plot point. It's not just Yo, no, yes. background. It's kinda, like, kinda, okay. you know, like everybody <clears throat> look over here. Wow, deadpans his wife. Nothing gets past you, Bob. It's obvious Taylor has too much. Now that's that's how they played it. Yeah, that's the first time there's ever been a same-sex couple on the, the Disney, Disney Channel, Channel, which is a children's channel. And I I just have to you know I'm going on record. I'm not opposed to kids knowing about the variety of the world. I'm not opposed to that. Many parents I think want to be the ones that introduce the topic mm-hmm. to their kids and not necessarily have the Disney Channel do it for them. And I think this is mm. going to be a big issue. Going forward, a bigger issue going forward. I mean, how long can there not be a same-sex couple on Sesame Street? Or same-sex puppets. Muppets. Well, puppets are technically genderless. No, they're not. Technically. Technically. They don't have anything below the belly button. (laughs) I don't even know what to say. Can I show you one of my puppets? (laughs) Okay, back up. Okay, sorry. Back up. They're not genderless. Like, Elmo is a boy. And uh, Zoe is, is a girl. Is Elmo a boy? Yeah. How do you know? Because he's Spanish Elmo. and his name ends in O. It's Elmo. El Elmo. Yeah. He doesn't sound Spanish. Well, he is. It's just too high pitched to tell. Elmo, I'm a boy. Like like Oscar the Grouch is a boy because of his name is Oscar. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So th- what do you mean? There's no gender. Okay. In okay. Okay. But there aren't really couples. Cookie Monster. There aren't. There aren't unless unless Bert Ernie and Ernie. And Bert, yeah. yeah don't there even you go. go the first there. gay couple on television. Don't even go there. So. Wait a minute, back up. It was the odd couple. Yeah, Oscar I know that. And, and <clears throat> no, not Oscar. The odd couple. Oscar Madison. Oh, yeah, yeah, that Oscar. Not and Oscar the Grouch. No, 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 no. There are many Oscars in my... And Oscar the Grouch, I believe, was based on Oscar Madison. Isn't Oscar example. the Grouch in, like, a recycling can now? I don't know. I don't know that. I think they've gone green. I haven't watched Sesame Street in quite a while. Okay, make your point. My point, what was my point? Stunning rebuttal. Okay, no, not rebuttal. Enter now. I'm not rebuttaling, but you got got to remember the way our culture has pretty much a word. Rebuttal? You said rebuttaling. I'm not rebuttaling? Yeah, that's fun. (laughs) Which side do you rebuttal your toast? Okay, go ahead. I'm waiting. Okay, The, the way the culture has chosen to generally frame this narrative is one of civil rights. Yes. And our playbook for civil rights is, of course, African-American civil rights. Yes. Most people... What about the Inuit? You mean like like Eskimos? Yeah. What about them? Well... That's Canadian civil rights. Do we... In Alaska? Oh, I guess they're in Alaska, too. (sighs) I don't think so. We did buy that from Russia. Yeah, so why don't we have like a whole lot of, you know, Inuit are underrepresented on our TV shows and in the NBA. Why aren't we doing things (laughs) to try to get more (laughs) Inuit into places of power? Okay, go back to your your point. Wow. Yes. So, okay. So wait, 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 wait. American so that's our playbook. Civil rights is our playbook. That's our playbook. I'm with you. And at some point, African American characters start showing up in television shows. Yes. Right with Sidney Poitier and in I uh, guess who's coming to dinner, and then it be you know one thing after another, and then they went from being just servant figures like extras to core main characters, and then eventually you had your first interracial couple. and all. So there was that kind of clear agenda in television to put those things you know, more front and center. But on the flip side, you didn't, like, children didn't have to be introduced to the fact that there were black people in the world because they could see that. Right. Unless they were in some rural place where they didn't exist and they had no television. Right. Um, 
so I think they're using the same playbook to say, hey, this is what we did to make sure that African Americans were, were, were respected and, yeah, and represented yeah. in our media and television and things. We're going to do the same thing with gay couples. Yeah. But you can't put a gay character on the TV and automatically know they're gay the way you put an Asian or an African American right. or a woman or whatever. So you need to somehow. Unless they ask. Unless, like, for a male character, they act flamboyantly gay, which is no longer that's no right, longer considered because right, it's accepted. a stereotype. And yes. It's not. So, so the only way to depict that a, that a person or characters are are gay is to show them in a relationship. Right. So I think we're using the same playbook, but it requires a little bit, and, th- and that's why they're doing this rather than saying, "Oh, we're just going to let parents." Do you remember speaking of homosexuality? Do you remember when we talked about the the uh, new scientific theory that epigenetics might be epigenetics? Yes, might yeah. be behind it. I actually went and found that study because I was like, "What exactly was that?" Because I heard about. Did it you ever see the Nova in PBS passing. Nova show on epigenetics? No, it's really fascinating. I highly recommend it to anybody who wants to spend an hour watching public television. So it's. It's a fairly detailed, rather dry. It was a study done in the uh, United States and Sweden, and it's not actually. It's based on some theories more than actual data. They now have to find the well, data. Well, why to am back I listening the to theory. this then? But it's based on other things that we know for sure. Like we know that that gender develops, you know, in utero based on some epigenetic markers, that certain aspects of gender develop based on epigenetic markers that do not stay with you through adulthood. Some of them are erased and then reprogrammed later to indicate other things and accomplish other things. And the theory was that there's an epigenetic marker that protects a a male fetus from being over-influenced by uh, the basically the, the, the femininity of the mother. The estrogen in the mother's yeah. system. Well, not just the estrogen in the mother's system, which is what I thought it, it said, but it's more than that. It's more about the, ep, uh, the epigenetic markers that it inherits from its mother that could potentially influence it too much to develop towards the female side okay. of things. And because it's reverse, you also get some from your father that prevent you from being too influenced towards the feminine side of things. Okay, And the theory is is that these markers in some cases don't switch on fully. They don't quite do what they're supposed to do. Okay. Um, and so and that produces homosexuality. They haven't proved it, but mm-hmm. that's their suggestion. So why does it matter? This is what's in, to ask Christian's question from this last is why does it matter? What's interesting because they, in in the story in Science Magazine they interview the researchers who say you know we would have to do more studies to figure out if this is the case, um, and then the, and they're asking another uh, what's her name I forget, uh, I get her name uh, she's a, a, a biologist uh, that was not related but they ask her her opinion um, and her final conclusion and this is actually how. They end the article. Fascinating as it may be to understand the biological basis of sexual orientation, however, not everyone is convinced it's a necessary line of investigation. And this uh, somebody, McCarthy, a, a female biologist, says, should we test this? Is it important for us to know? Uh, homosexuality is not a disease. It's part of natural human variation. I'm not sure there's a good reason to, de- to delve this deeply into it. I think we've reached the point that we have enough evidence that there's a biological basis for sexual orientation. And I think that's fascinating because what this is a scientist that's saying stop researching in that direction. Because the assumption is if you research, you're looking well, for a solution you could to actually, a problem. Yes. If it, in fact, is a mal- an epigenetic malfunction. You're an epigenetic malfunction. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Put that on a (laughs) T-shirt. If it, in fact, is an epigenetic malfunction, what if you discovered you could fix it? But this is true of almost all genetic research. I I know, but the point is that that, see, that's the difference between saying homosexuality is a civil rights issue and saying it's a disabilities issue. Because if you say, wow, this is something genetic that we could actually correct, now you're putting it in the category of sickle cell anemia. That's what sickle cell anemia is. Mm-hmm. It is this thing doesn't get turned on the way it should. You've got these two genes. They combine poorly, and you get misshaped <laughs> oxygen. But we've already decided that that's not what homosexuality is, so we can't go that direction. It's, yeah, it's the word should. It's political. Right. 
So what, what and I think this is interesting because what you actually see here is a scientist saying, let's stop looking in that direction for political reasons. But aren't there other qualities that you could argue um, are caused by a gene functioning or not functioning the way yeah. it's supposed to, but they're not, it's not a, yeah. it's not a disease issue. It's a but propensities, right? Propensities. Right. But you would never see, here's the, here's the distinction. You would never say, oh, okay, which gene didn't work that made you turn out Asian? But, but that's a whole but, different but thing. You, you could say, you could say what, what, what was activated here that, that some kids are born with this birthmark. Yeah. And you could argue, right. Is that birthmark good or bad? Is, no, it, it just is. Is there a functional disadvantage to the birthmark? Right, and that's what we're saying as a culture. There's no longer a and, disadvantage and what we're si- yeah, to same-sex attraction. So the question would be, how many you know, 13-year-old boys who are just discovering that they have attraction that doesn't match what all their friends have, if you said, hmm, we could have prevented that, and you could be like your friends— would say no, no, no. I like this better. Yeah, but the, the, this yeah. is a this is a coulda, woulda, shoulda what? thing. No, what if you what if you could what if you could so have prevent? In other it? words, what if every pregnant woman could take a pill to guarantee that her child would not be gay? Yeah, that's the question. Yeah, would would she or take no? The not pill? would she do it? Should should that line how, of reasoning how about even should, be pursued? Should that pill even be made available as a choice? Sh- should that not only should it be made available, should we even walk down the research path of thinking that might be something to pursue? And at this point, the scientific community is saying, "No, no, no." You're saying one person. Yes, and she's in charge. She's the she's <laughs> the boss of science. She's the Queen Latifah of she, the scientific community. <laughs> but her license well, expires but, by tomorrow. But when, but when you watch the Grammys, see, which is where I go for my scientific yeah, yeah, insights, yeah, 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 yeah. The question is, and and for most of history, homosexuality was viewed like being born without the use of your legs. It, it was it, it was, was an impairment. It was a disability. Mm-hmm. It was something you know that. Well, actually, no. Most of human history, at least in the West, homosexuality was, was viewed a choice. As, not no. even a choice. It was viewed as an abomination. It was a sin, yeah, right? So like it, not being able to use your legs. Well. Not exactly. It's sin. What's, what sin did you commit that you can't? Well, okay, but, okay. but not enti- It's a little no. different. The point is we could have protected. Um, we protect people with disabilities mm-hmm. under the American Disabilities Act. Mm-hmm. We protect people with, uh, who are being discriminated against for ethnic reasons mm-hmm. under the Civil Rights Act. So homosexuality, you could have extended the same protections going have, either way. But we, oh, I see what you, you mean. You could have gone either way. You could have said, let's let this could we could we could protect this class of people because they're it's not an ethnicity, it's not gender it's gender related, but it's not normal gender function but biologically th- speaking. We could have gone the route of protect, protection as disability, but politically. But that door was closed back in the 70s when the American Psychiatric Association removed homosexuality from its list of psychiatric disorders. Right. So you can't call it right. a disability if it's not... A disability if, if, in the book. Yeah, if, if it's not in the, the book. book. It kind of reminds me... There was a point where the decision was made. We're not going that way. There was, a, there was an interesting... And, and now, sorry, I'm sorry I'm interrupting you so You're much. So it's horribly... Rude. I can't it's believe horribly it. rude. I'm going to make you just talk to my but But now... Skull. But now... <laughs> What planet are you from? If you're going to keep talking, I'm going to pretend oh, like I'm still listening. Great so. crystal skull. Mm-hmm. Now we're at a point, though, where even if science were to say, hey, there's a switch here. If we flip the switch the other way, you don't go that way. So this Look, remi- And then we say, wait, wait, you can't do that. You can't do that because we've already settled it. It's like being Asian. You don't want a switch that turns off your Asian, and you don't want a switch that turns off your gay. It reminds me of two things now. <laughs> okay. Two stories I came across a while ago. One was apparently in, in I think it's Japan, there, yeah. some people were getting a cousin. Where, where there are gay Asians. Gaysians. <laughs> Not to be confused with geishas. Yeah. Which are. Okay, different. Geishas. Different. All right. So apparently there was a cosmetic procedure that was being done in Japan where, uh, maybe it was Japan, it could have been China, where, where, where some people were getting um, folds put into their eyelids, yeah. more like a Caucasian right. eye where there's a fold South here. South Korea. Is it South Korea? Maybe. It was somewhere over there. So it or would, Germany. It, it would make people with typically Asian facial right. features look, look, more more, look more Western, more European. Right. And a lot of people were... How did that make you feel? 
bad. Well, I, I, bit the bad. debate was interesting because on one side people were saying, hey, if they want to do this, they should be able to do this, however they, you know, whatever. And then there were others who were saying, no, this is this is a form of racism, saying that mm-hmm. to, to have typical Asian features is not acceptable, and it became this whole mm-hmm. brouhaha. The mm-hmm. other thing it reminds me of is I saw this story years ago. So what does that lead you to? Well, it's, it's, it gets to one of those I questions of... I learn something from that story. Well, it's interesting. Like, people want to modify their appearance because they think that who they are inherently... Right. is deficient in right. some way. The one that I think is more interesting that relates to this is I saw a story years ago of a family where everyone was deaf. Mm-hmm. Father's deaf, mother's deaf, children are all, it's some genetic okay. thing. Where Very they're, deaf they're, family. They're all deaf. And they're part of a deaf community. And I don't mean deaf like cool. <laughs> I mean like... You mean fat? I mean like literally deaf. They okay. cannot hear. So, it's, and, and it's, a, it's a very tight-knit community. That's, it's part of their culture, the sign language. You know, language is a big part of any culture, so yeah. that's just who they are. Anyway, yeah. one of the, I think, adult children who'd reached like 18, 19, 20 years old decided to get a cochlear implant oh. and, and hear for the first time. And this kid, this daughter, I believe, was completely shunned by the family okay. and by the community. And, and the message that they sent was being deaf is not a disability. It's an identity. It's who we are. And for you to reject your deafness Good in order to hear was a, right. a rejection of your whole right. family, a rejection <laughs> of your community. It's a rejection of your identity. And I, right. I thought this is remarkable. I, obviously, I can't speak into this. I don't have any experience in that community. Yeah. But there's an example of a, of a family who has so embraced what most people would identify as a deficiency right. as part of their identity, their identity and right. really amazingly overcome it that th- that it's now but, seen as a liability to right. overcome your deficiency. But I think you've moved to a different point when you start to say to your own children, you must accept this disability as a part of your identity. But they wouldn't even say it's a disability. They they would say to their own children, "You must accept this as not a disability." Right. And but I isn't say, that? I, mean, I really would like to hear things. But isn't that kind of the cultural Mom. shift that we've made on on sexuality, where we've yeah, said if so. you're same sex attracted, this is not how it should be. I'm using air quotes. Right. Biologically. Biologically, speaking. and now we're at a place where no, this is okay. This is acceptable. This is right. just how you are, and let's embrace it and even celebrate it on the Grammys. Okay. I had an interesting conversation with my wife. I can. Imagine. And uh, uh, because a friend of hers, uh, uh, a female friend of hers posted something on Beyonce and Miley Cyrus after the after the Grammys saying, is this an affront? And she would consider herself a feminist. She said, is this an affront to feminism? Are, are Miley Cyrus and Beyonce and that kind of behavior anti-feminist? You, this, wait, or, your, your, your wife's friend is a feminist. Yes. Lisa doesn't consider herself a feminist, does she? N- uh, depends on how you define it, but right, probably not. Sure. <clears throat> no. Um, and and she was kind of defending them because, you know, Miley is a great performer and a strong woman. So, you know, the closing line was stop insulting her and let her twerk if yeah, she wants you've to. You've got to be a strong woman to ride a wrecking ball naked. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. And, and, and my response was, and this goes back to the NFL, okay, because NFL players, you would say the NFL player, the mixed martial arts player is a caricature of masculinity. Okay, that's Mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, what we put on the wall when we want to think about masculinity. We we put that's apparently what's on your wall. Yeah. Haven't you seen my wall? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, The the Miley Cyrus, the Beyonce, those are caricatures of femininity. They're femininity taken way over here. Right. They're strong women and they're women who get their way. So are they feminist? Is that a feminist model? And, or a dominatrix? And my con- yeah, and my contention was um, is not feminist. It's anti-feminist because the meaning, the worth in their lives is derived from men. Because they've they've become objects. Yeah, uh, effectively, They're yeah. Objectified. Because if you take, and this is the difference between what, an NFL player and Miley Cyrus, or a you know a pop star, a sexualized pop star, an NFL player in the world in a world completely without women has the exact same meaning. 
has the exact same cultural significance. Because he's appealing to men. Uh, because because he his he's uh, pr- presenting strength, which yeah. does not need the opposite sex to make it valuable. Yeah, NFL players are not validated by women. Right. Yet pop stars that act like Miley Cyrus are entirely validated by men. And if she existed in a woman in, in a world without men, she would lose all her meaning. Wow. Hmm? Okay. Hmm? So right. isn't that a way to look at, you know, and so as we look at our own daughters and, and the pressure of the world, when we say, you know, when we say Christianity is anti-feminist because of, you know, things that Paul wrote that we interpret one way or another or whatever, um, then we point now in the modern world, we have strong women. We have strong women, but what we're pushing kids, what we're pushing little girls toward more and more in the modern world, in culture especially, are models that only exist in their relationship to men. Well, I, I agree. I think, I think that makes sense. Mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm. Obviously, we would like to see a world in which every person is valued for the content of their character, as Martin Luther King said. Right. Or for their intelligence, for their creativity, for their contribution of their gifts and the talents and abilities. I'm so, with you there. I mean, I, don't, I would probably say Miley Cyrus is a talented young woman. Certainly Beyonce is a very talented person. But their talent and ability alone isn't enough in our culture. Because then they have to ha- do to accomplish what they want to accomplish, right? Because then they have to be objectified as a sex object, right? And that that's really sad that they that they effectively get their definition but from men. I think that that may which is be as rooted in backwards as it could possibly yeah, be. Yeah, but it's rooted it's rooted in, in something profoundly biological about the interaction of men and women as a human dynamic. But why doesn't dynamic? it work the other way? Because women don't care about sexuality of men nearly as men much as men care about the sexuality of women. But why can't, why can't more, why such a focus on women who can create value through their appeal to men? Oh my goodness. It's called today. The, it's today. The, it's the oldest profession. Today. Phil. Why haven't we moved away from that? And why Bec- do we think we, we have? Because because we're still men. Why do we? And they're still women. Why do and we? Men think will still we're pay civilized. money to to to. This yeah. is old. This is like <laughs> the oldest profession. Why do we think we're modern when we still do this to women? I don't think or, that. Or women do this to themselves. You don't think we're modern? No. Oh, okay. I mean, well, technically we are, but I don't think the the basic dynamic has changed. Okay. And I think it's a, a little bit of, of uh, a delusion if you think it is. Okay. Well, I was just happy with myself because I had actually thought of a way to define why I don't like what they're doing as women, even though they're strong, quote mm-hmm. unquote, women that are exerting power over their environment, but they exist entirely in a definition created by men yes and that would vanish without men right and that seems to be the opposite so what about what what about what about the men out there who uh you know are (sighs) chippendale dancers yeah there's something like that or who are always yes it's the same thing there aren't very many of those there aren't very i mean if if you look for the the male version of beyonce or what is that fabio Seriously? The guy that poses for all the romance covers. And the he, butter commercials? He, yeah, he has defined himself out of the desires okay, of women. wait a minute. No, wait a minute. Let's back yes. up. Wait, 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 so let's, let's talk in stereotypes. Well, that'll never sell. <laughs> let's talk in stereotypes for a second. Okay. Men, a lot of men are, are mm-hmm. very driven by sexual desires. Yes, okay. this is true. So that means, I have noticed this. Yes, that means that women like Miley Cyrus and Beyonce and others tend yeah. to sexualize their themselves, themselves for, money. for money for men's right. You know, to get their attention, which we're not supposed to call in, prostitution. In general, that's rude. In general, we're supposed to call it art. In general, yes, women are not nearly as driven by visual sexual stimulation right. as men are. But what does attract women? Romance novels. Well, but it's romance, it's and, relationship, and it's intimacy of 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 and communication. Long golden hair. So what is it that what what is like Are you just ignoring everything that I'm saying? No, I, I it's just <laughs> you won't 
Do you understand what I'm getting at? Like, I yes. think I think the version, yes. the, the male version. What's the male version of, of a Miley Cyrus or a Beyonce is not a scantily clad man. No, he's not scantily clad. It's, he's just beautiful. It's a sensitive rich man. Yeah, he's sensitive. It's, it's a, oh, yeah, a sensitive, a rich sensitive, man? you know, powerful. Is there such a thing? A sensitive, like it, it, it's you don't get it's to Vladimir be rich. Putin. Oh and he, yeah, and he takes sensitive. his shirt off all the time too. He's only five seven. I heard somewhere that he's like the epitome of of, of masculinity in Russia. Like women swoon over him. And he's bald. I'll add that. What was your point? <laughs> I'm saying you can't just strip some clothes off a man and say, "Oh, that's a female beyond or a male Beyonce." Right, right. There's a whole different right. set of okay. qualities that women okay. look for. Yeah, but a, d- but it's it's George Clooney. Do you think he has shaped his life to be considered desirable by women, other than like brushing his teeth and getting his hair cut regularly? I don't know. I, I mean, I'm a Brad Pitt or a George Clooney, I'm sure that a lot of their career and success depends on making sure that they are attractive is, to women. Is this partly just the historical dominance of men and that they don't feel like they have to please anyone well, I think Well, I think the way they attract women is different. You, I mean, Brad Pitt does not have to strip naked and ride around on a wrecking ball to get women's attention. No, but have you seen him do that? It's awesome. <laughs> That was in the outtakes of 12 Monkeys, wasn't it? I think so. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Final story. Final story. The big debate is I gotta coming up. I got to write a sermon. Let's I know you got to write a I sermon. Can't. The big debate is coming up. The big debate. Which the one? The rumble in the jungle. Oh. The, what's, what's now being referred to globally as ham on rye. I love nye. it. Ham nye. on nye. Ham on rye. Ham nye. on nye. Nye, right. <laughs> it is nye unto ham on nye. Uh, Ken Ham, Bill Nye, the science guy, as, as we record this, it's coming up in five days. Is that it? And the world is a buzz. Mm, buzz. What's interesting is we've talked about my, my new atheist friends, and some of uh, my, my bestest new atheist buddies would be Dr. Peter Bogosian and um, uh, uh, James Lindsay, who's also a PhD of mathematics. And they together wrote a piece. I didn't even know they were friends. They together wrote a piece about this. Atheists are all friends. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, about Ham on Nye and how much they're against this. Which And their piece was posted on Richard Dawkins' website. Richard Dawkins, he's the king atheist. He's the pope. He has the atheist mitre, crown, yeah. and, and the holy relics. Um, which I think is some of Madeline Murray O'Hare's uh, hair from the back of her head. So they wrote a piece and they said, and it was kind of interesting because it, it went along the line of uh, what they've been saying all along, which I can't find. It actually goes along the lines of Peter Bogosian's book that I talked about, which is if they are going to debate, if Bill Nye is going to debate um, this you know, silly Ken, Ken Ham fellow, um, he needs to focus on one thing. He needs to focus not on creationism and you know evolution and all that. He needs to focus on uh, whether or not faith is a valid way to know things. The epistemology piece. <clears throat> the epistemology. So, um, and this is their complaint. Uh, Okay. Faith and theology more broadly does not possess or employ a mechanism for falsification and appears only incidentally interested in observation. Um, Faith is a patently bad way to claim knowledge and perhaps more tragically an effort in furthering the delusions of those who employ it in an attempt to possess truth. Over half of, and this is what they're really mad about, over half of Republicans believe that God created humans in present form within the last 10,000 years, a view shared by 40% of the U.S. electorate. Many of these individuals are likely to be excited to see Ken Ham standing on stage next to Bill Nye and asserting that faith-based conclusions are just as reflective of reality as conclusions that come about as a result of the scientific method. The rest of us only hope Bill Nye is able to frame his arguments exclusively in a manner that exposes creationism as a symptom of a larger cultural crisis using faith to know anything at all. So they, so want, the, they want to hijack the debate. They don't. Well, they don't even want these two to debate because they no, think they it gives to too debate. much credibility to Ken Ham. Uh, yeah, Richard Dawkins says uh, that the debate gives the oxygen of respectability to the creationist position. 
Now he's assuming that the creationist That's me sucking in the oxygen the creationist of credibility. position isn't like a tree that lives on carbon dioxide. Because right. that oxygen would, would, would kill it. So the creationist position is, is clearly an animal, not a plant. Right, but it existed as that animal form so from we, the beginning. So we learned something already today. Here's the thing, though. I, 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 I kind of feel like Ken Ham loses already. Why? Because his whole, on the epistemology thing, yeah. the premise, as far as I understand it, of his Answers in Genesis ministry is forcing the Bible to give scientific answers or explaining the Bible through the, the, the methodology of science. So we have to come up with an explanation for stratification of, of layers of the earth. And, oh, that's the flood. And this. So he's already giving science the upper hand by saying the Bible must submit to what we can prove through science. And therefore he forces all these narratives from Genesis mm-hmm. to make sense through scientific models. Okay. Rather than... Maybe. I mean, does that make sense? Yeah, I'm not sure I agree with that, but I can I think see he's already given... He, he's, already, he's already forced his adherents to say the scriptures submit to science. There, there is uh, one of the major critiques of, of the creation science point of view and the, and the difference between creationism... You know, someone asked me if I was a creationist, and, and I said yes. But you didn't ask me if I was a young Earth creationist, or a day age creationist, mm-hmm. or a, a, a gap theory creationist, or a theistic evolutionary creationist. They're all creationists. Um, the uh, creation science is specifically saying we're going to take the traditional reading, kind of the su- the surface level reading of Genesis one, mm-hmm. and we're going to build science out of that. And we're going to then look at what we see in the fossil record mm-hmm. and, and try to make them connect. You know, it's like starting a train from the train track from the West Coast and a train track from the East Coast and trying to make them meet right, in the but middle. Here's where I think he failed. I didn't say what the critique was yet. Oh, I said that's what critique. he's trying to do. Right. The, the critique is that it's um, enlightenment thinking. Right. That it is basically, you know, 18th, 19th century thinking that we can approach the Bible uh, through scientific inquiry, that we can think about the Bible scientifically right. and come up with results as if we are, you know, 19th century scientific thinkers. Right. And that's where that's where people are pushing back more and more nowadays and saying that's not what, especially the oldest parts of the Bible. Well, yeah, that's Definitely what John not. Walton has been on the show I've numerous times. And so, but that, that's my yeah. point is when it, your analogy of these two trains, you're already assuming that truth can be known through scripture, scientific truth yes. through scripture. Yeah. And and scientific truth can be known through modern science. So you're putting them on equal level and saying truth must be in both of these, therefore they must be reconciled together. And I think that you're giving, you're misinterpreting scripture and forcing it to a standard that it never was held to. Should, an, to should answer questions it's right. not asking. But you're also automatically giving credibility to the modern scientific method and saying that this also must be true. So that's why you have these conflicts. And I, I, so I think Ken Ham is already lost the battle on where does where does ultimate truth lie scripture or science because he's saying they have to both be true and reconciled to each other well there you go there you go so uh, that'll be february 4th and it's streaming live and are you gonna watch it'll be up on facebook that's like the real big game this week isn't it no i i i I mostly watch for the commercials yeah i love the the uh ham on night uh show commercials maybe there'll be a a, a wardrobe malfunction And Ham's goatee falls off. (laughs) Or Bill Nye's, it'd be Bill Nye's bow tie. Oh, yeah. Like spins or blows up or something. (sighs) Okay. (laughs) I'm not sure which part to sing about. (laughs) The Grammys or Bill Nye, it's so much fun. Oh, did you watch the Grammys? If, if you did, I hope you weren't there with your mammy Cause she might have been offended by the liturgy of sexuality And what they say about love is kinda funny Oh, but just in a couple of days We're gonna have a debate that'll go both ways From science to the Bible and back again With Bill Nye, the science guy, and... Ham named Ken. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> oh, dude. 
Do you like green eggs and ham? If you want to watch, you can tell them who you am. And we might, might learn a thing or two. But probably not. And that's a little bit depressing. Okay, goodbye. See you next week. And we'll talk about the Super Bowl and, hey guys. and the uh, big debate. 